the topic, it's okay to have a bad day. So to um, get started, I'd like to ask uh, a few questions about how you've experienced the last two years. Uh, just by show of raising hands, how many of you missed the old normal? Okay, a few, not, not a few of you, many of you, almost everyone. How many of you feel anxious about the future? Uh, how many feel stuck sometimes? Classic sign of depression, right? So we're all really depressed in this room, apparently. And how many of you feel like you are to blame? So this is, this is the key question, and this is something I'm very interested in. Um, people talk about mental health and well-being as an individual issue, but we know that the world is a different place than it was two years ago. Uh, and we might not be responsible for, for all of those things. Uh, so, so many crises that we talk about, so many challenges, uh, the nature of security and conflict, post-truth world, emerging asocial society, uh, new bioage, erosion of different cultural traditions, these are all things we're facing today. Um, and this is where I'd like to start us with considering that uh, it's okay to have a bad day, that's there's a lot of things we're, we're grappling with as humans and as educators. Uh, and this is based roughly on the book which was mentioned previously by Tasha. Uh, it was published about uh, a year ago, Beyond Virtue, the Politics of Educating Emotions. So this book discusses um, a, num a number of emotions that are emphasized in education, including happiness, gratitude, compassion, uh, also so-called negative emotions such as anger and fear uh, and sadness. But today I'm going to zoom in on two specific topics in the, from the book, which are the concept of well-being and resilience. Uh, so I'm going to start by discussing some different views of emotions, what they mean for well-being and resilience, and what they mean for education, for us as teachers thinking about well-being and resilience of students and teachers. So, when it comes to education, there are three major views of emotions that I think are important and prevalent to consider. Uh, one of them is a psychological view. So, if you're a teacher, you've surely taken a class in education psychology, and a lot of educational research is underpinned by a, a psychological view when it comes to emotions. There's also the philosophical view. Uh, this sort of, it might come from your cultural background, so I'll discuss that as well. And what I'm going to argue for is that actually a sociological view is also very important uh, and should be considered more broadly when it comes to our emotions and how they relate to society and education. So to start with the psychological view of emotions, there is generally, and when it comes to education, a view that emotions are inside us and that we're in control of our emotions or that we ought to be. When it comes to education, uh, there's actually a long history of discussing academic emotions. Uh, this is a common term used in psychology today. And in the past, they actually discussed mental hygiene. Um, and in early US history, they said mental hygiene was one of the most important uh, things that school, that school children needed, uh, this idea of cleaning your mind. And the discourse used to be all about mental, but it's kind of shifted to emotional over the years. So there's a focus on what is needed to succeed in life or school. I also discuss this as a functional view, because the individual needs to fit in to the social situation. They need to adapt to the situation. So there's a situation, and you need to put yourself in it like a puzzle piece in a puzzle. Uh, so this is one of my favorite books, which has really influenced my work. It was written in 1999 by Megan Buller um, about emotions in education, and she discusses the history of emotions in education. And she has a quote from New York City High School Teacher Association, 1912. Comparison between schools and mercantile establishments. Uh, the teacher corresponds to the planning department, manager of a factory, the elements in the enterprise, the workmen, the resources, the products, 
are combined in the pupil. So here there's a strong metaphor that school is like a factory today. Um, you, you can't go more than a day or two without people discussing schools as businesses and universities as businesses. So we're like a business or a factory, and the pupils are one part of that factory. Today, there is a big emphasis on emotional intelligence and positive psychology, and these have been strongly influential when it comes to the uh, education for well-being movement that we see today. Emotional intelligence became popular in the 1980s, uh, and it's become popular in society and in schools. And the people who advocated for emotional intelligence, they said increased team performance, increased leadership, increased personal well-being, decreased stress, and the point of this is that you need this intelligence to succeed in the workplace. So in terms of education, there was a recommendation, firstly, that people recognize their emotional states and learn how to regulate them and reflect on their emotional states. So we should teach children to know how they're feeling and also to know how other people are feeling around them in order to maneuver and adapt to the situation and make the situation go as well as possible. In the 1980s and 1990s, positive psychology also became very popular. Uh, so there was one book uh, in America called Who Moved My Cheese? Uh, and this was seen as trying to respond to the financial crisis that happened at that time to help people who were laid off from jobs due to uh, economic crisis and to tell them, uh, you know, somebody moved your cheese, so you're a rat. Apparently the metaphor is that you're a rat in a maze. Uh, I admit I haven't read the book myself uh, fully, but I've read a lot about it. So you're a rat in a maze, and this, this gate to the cheese has been moved, so you have to learn to move a different way. So I find that to be a bit of a crude metaphor. Um, but positive psychology has really exploded since then. It's been... Uh, you can definitely critique it from a Western or American viewpoint. It did come from an American perspective on psychology. Um, and Barbara Eherrench, uh, she has a book that came out more recently, Bright Sided, How Positive Thinking is Undermining America. So this is another great reference. Um, and it's, it's written, it's very easy to read this one. It's not particularly academic because she was a, a former journalist. So this is a great book to read if you're interested in understanding what's wrong with uh, positive psychology and the urge to always be happy. So there are challenges to this view uh, and to the psychological view of emotions. So one of the challenges is, are targets beneficial or moral or just useful? So uh, we see today positive psychology taken up by the US Army, um, by corporations, and Underpinning a lot of this discourse is you become a better person, you contribute to society, but uh, you could contribute in society in a very selfish way. You could just learn how to adapt to situations in order to do better in your job. You're not being a better person necessarily. Are the concepts coherent? A lot of people say methodologically, the concepts are not coherent, underpinning emotional intelligence. So there's a lot of criticism of uh, the emotional intelligence scales and measurement tools. More significant to me is do interventions really work? How do they work? Um, I think that there's been a lot of research um, that shows these things work. So educational researchers typically want to say, uh, I did some research and this works, because if I go around saying, guess what, all these interventions don't work. Uh, nobody's gonna fund my program because I'm not offering a solution. So people want to have solutions, people want to offer solutions, so they tend to ignore the ways in which their methodologies are problematic. Um, just to say, uh, well-being is important, don't you think so? And then you ask a student and the student says, yes, well-being is very important to me. People act like this is an intervention that works, uh, but I would suggest counter that. Um, we teach arithmetic every single year in school, so it doesn't work the first time. Likewise, with emotional education, people have very simplified notions of what works that I argue can be problematic in the long run. And finally, are diverse people accounted for in your schema? So I'll say a lot more about this as well. 
One of the problems related to understanding emotions, if we really think more deeply about how psychologists would do research about emotions, is it's a little hard to know what emotions are really and what a person's emotions are. Um, when you think about the methods that scientists use in order to uh, discover new things or do an experiment, a lot of people will rely on some kind of observation, but you can't really observe an emotion. Um, we can say that a person is happy if they're smiling and they're, they're upset if they're sad and doing certain expressions, but that's not really cross-culturally relevant. People can fake it. Uh, I remember learning that the famous motto of McDonald's, uh, service with a smile, a lot of people said they had to change that in Hong Kong because smiling doesn't really signify the same thing in customer service here as it does in America. So observation is quite difficult. Today, people use neuroscience. And I'm just not sure where you find emotions in the brain. Uh, so that's one part of it. And maybe you say you can get around that somehow and find an emotion in the brain. But also, is it good? How do you tinker with it? So you can use experimentation, but this is also possibly unethical. Uh, I remember a few years ago, Facebook was doing experiments with people's emotions or something like that, and people found that to be deeply problematic. So we can't really experiment. So we rely on self-report or other reports um, where people have to identify their own emotions. And people feel confident about this because in positive psychology and emotional intelligence, one of the key points is to identify your own emotions or identify others' emotions. So there's an assumption that this works, but I do want to challenge that um, and suggest not everyone has that emotional identification and regulation skill, um, which they're discussing as something we should all um, aim to attain as people in society. And actually, Seligman said, anyone who lacks this ability is morally deficient. So autistic people, a lot of people who've been traumatized, don't have emotional identification skills. And I would suggest this doesn't make people morally deficient or anything like that. So this leads me to some philosophical views around emotions, and I think philosophical views also underpin the psychological views in certain ways. In my book, I discuss a range of philosophical views and how they connect to emotions and to virtues in society. Um, but here, I'm going to focus on what have been the most influential and prevalent of views, which are virtue ethics and care ethics. Um, they have some interesting commonalities with Confucianism, which I discuss in the book. Um, I'm quite interested in Confucianism, living here in Hong Kong. Uh, and these views also intertwine and complement the popular psychological views in some significant ways. So according to virtue ethics, we have emotions which intersect with our virtues. In other words, our emotions are related to if we're good people or not, if we're doing good things or not. And the point is to match your emotional state with doing the right thing. So when it comes to gratitude, uh, if somebody gives, if you give your three-year-old son or daughter a treat, or, or grandma or grandpa gives a small child a treat, you tell them, say thank you. And Maybe they don't even say thank you, and then you say, okay, say thank you, and then they say, okay, thank you, and you can tell they don't really feel it. So there's an idea that you learn to feel it over time, um, and there's an interplay with this concept of phrenesis, which Aristotle discussed in ancient Greece, which is that there's a connection of your reason and your feelings, and you think about the connection between the two over time uh, within phrenesis. So here, emotional identification is also important, like in the psychological view, because you have to reflect on your emotions and how to um, enhance your emotions to enhance your uh, behaviors in society. So according to virtue ethics, you can learn virtues, uh, firstly, by emulation and habituation. As I mentioned, children don't feel um, gratitude necessarily. We teach them. And there's an idea The first you imitate and emulate, then you make a habit of it. And um, actually, Confucius uh, said very similar things, and a number of Confucian scholars also emphasize the same, that you practice and you practice. And you don't 
necessarily feel the right feelings when you do good things, but you practice over and over. Um, and then when you're, I think Confucius said when he was 70, he got it all fused together so that it complemented each other, um, but it takes practice. Uh, you can also use direct instruction, of course. We can talk in schools about the benefits of well-being, resilience, gratitude, caring, and so on. Practice. And part of virtue ethics is accepting imperfections and continuing to strive, knowing that you're never going to be perfect. It's virtuous to accept that you're not going to be perfect, to be humble, uh, and still persevering nonetheless. So virtue ethics, uh, similar to positive psychology, it's just exploded in popularity in the last few decades. Before the last few decades, people didn't think virtue ethics really existed, or they didn't really think it was important. But now it's become really important, and particularly in education. So I've been quite influenced by a book by Nell Noddings, who is also well known for um, developing what's called care ethics. So her first book was about caring in education and the importance of care ethics. And she wrote another book on happiness where she said, school should be helping students become happy and learn how to have happy lives. And this is another book that I highly recommend. It's quite lovely. Um, if you want to get a taste of philosophy of education, I remember I was a student when this came out and it blew my mind and I've been kind of a fan and kind of a critic of Noddings ever since. Today, um, one of the major centers for character education is the Jubilee Center for Character Education at the University of Birmingham. Um, and they've written a number of materials. You can download tons of things online talking about their research projects, their intervention studies, and curriculum materials and resources to teach about what they call character education. So here's some examples from the curriculum. Um, and this is from the Jubilee Center itself. So this is a guidebook for students. So this is like a workshop or a, a handout to, to give students. So it says, if I identify that I'm in survival zone and my adrenaline levels are high, this tells me that if I want to move zones, I need to do something to reduce my adrenaline, like mindful breathing, or something to increase my serotonin, time with good friends, see something funny, or both by building a repertoire of activities, which I know to affect my emotions in predictable ways, I can start to become skillful in the way that I experience emotion. So this quote matches perfectly with the emotional intelligence perspective, that once you know your feelings, you can control them, you can predict them, and you can manipulate them. Um, and certainly, there's some intuitive appeal to this, right? Um, I was on Zoom all day, on Monday, and I was in a bad mood, then I went for a run, then I felt better. Um, this isn't rocket science, um, it is helpful material, but I still want to make a critique of it. Um, so there's a few challenges to this view. One is uh, that people's roles and relations to other people are not always spelled out in this, and I think that uh, maybe it's that I've been living here in Hong Kong and have become influenced by Confucianism, but I think people's roles and relationships to each other do make a difference, and I'll say more about this. Identity factors, uh, gender, race, class, and so on. As I mentioned briefly, there are cultural differences, and there's an orientation towards the self and not others. So let me explain a little bit more what I mean here. So some... Um, Curriculum materials, which were very easy for me to make fun of in my book, come from a group called Character First in the United States. And they have materials on all these topics. And a child can color in the porcupine and learn about gratefulness at the same time. And somehow the porcupine is grateful. That's something they discuss, which is interesting. Um, I'm not a primary school teacher, so I can't really comment on it from a certain perspective. But you can see here that the guides say, I will. So it's about me doing something here. And there's a universalization. So everyone in here should, I will, in the same way. Uh, this is something I think is suggested by these materials. Here are some more examples from the character first. So they focus quite a bit on role models. And people emphasize the use of role models in 
Western culture, but I don't think they're used in quite the same way in some um, Asian and African cultures, but we can discuss more. So Abraham Lincoln was grateful, uh, and he was grateful even though his sister had passed away, he was grateful. So the point of the story is not really to learn about Abraham Lincoln and his life, but to learn about how he had gratitude. Being grateful in all situations. Uh, so I've written quite a bit about gratitude. So um, I think gratitude, like well-being and resilience, has its, its positive side and its dark side. So you should be grateful in all situations. You should be grateful for a new bicycle, nice clothes, a special trip. Uh, some people would describe this not as gratitude, but as appreciation. Um, and I describe it as appreciation rather than gratitude. One question that I have here is, how does being happy about a new bicycle or good health square with learning about how other people don't have those things? And uh, this is also really underscored for me in this other suggestion, and this is all from character first, that you should play a blindfold game and try to draw something and then point out the benefit of eyesight. So I think, why don't we learn, okay, what is problematic about people having different levels of eyesight? Um, what's, what's the nature of disability in society? I think those are interesting things to talk about. Um, and I think there's a bit of a tension here between focusing on those kinds of issues in terms of your civic or social responsibility to a greater good and just saying, well, I'm so glad I can see. I'm so glad I have a bicycle. I'm not sure that that's really a message that would be positive to put forward uh, in education. More problematic, uh, Jubilee Center has a, a number of curriculum materials where they talk about Anne Frank and they admire her humility and her honesty. Um, so she might have humility and honesty, but here the point isn't to learn about the horrors of Nazi Germany, and maybe we don't want to teach young children about the horrors of Nazi Germany because that's quite dark and sensitive and serious. But um, if you teach this curriculum and you don't teach about history or issues about justice or intolerance or these kinds of really important topics, um, I think that there is possibly a message being sent to young people. Um, okay, it didn't matter about Nazi Germany. It was really great that Anne Frank had humility. I just am not sure that that's what we want to do. Um, the poli so politics is actually hidden from view here. There's no politics, there's just the individual. And it was so great that Anne Frank had honesty because she could leave her diary for us. But wouldn't it have been better if she didn't have to leave her diary for us? I think that is a lesson that's worth teaching as well. So this leads me to um, what I could discuss as sociological views. I also discuss it in terms of the politics of educating emotion. So, I, so my argument is that um, virtue ethics and psychology have absolutely something beneficial to teach us, a lot of useful insights, but when taken to extreme version, it becomes a bit perverted because it ignores sociology, society, and politics. So a sociological view will have some different foundations thinkers that are thinking about the way society impacts the individual. So from a psychological view, there's the factory. Maybe it's a great factory, maybe it's a bad factory, but that doesn't matter. Just learn how to have a positive attitude. And gee, the people in the factory aren't feeling very well. This is what they said in the mental hygiene movement in the 1920s in New York. They said, some children are very unhappy because they don't think that they're going to have a successful life. So we need to clean their brains in order to teach them math and prepare them for these factory jobs. So the argument from a sociological view is maybe the society doesn't function. Maybe we need to think about, is the society functioning or not functioning? And who in society is being helped to function? For some people, it's easy to function in society. For other people, it's not easy to function in society. Maybe that's a society problem and not an individual problem. In the educational arena, uh, we find that teachers can act to support the conservative 
status quo, right? Um, so let's not talk about society, let's talk about meditation or what you can do. Um, they might also be conservative in terms of expecting certain social norms, that it's natural for little girls to be more happy and caring. It's not natural for little girls to be sad or angry. It's more okay for little boys to be sad or angry. These are things people tend to believe. These are messages three-year-olds learn. And it's not taught in the curriculum, of course, but these are subtle things that are taught over generations, which is part of a conservative status quo. So people learn different expectations about their emotions in school and life. So um, feminist theory has really influenced this movement, among other things. Uh, so as I've discussed, girls and women are expected in the workplace and schools and society to be good at caring, happy when caring. There's all kinds of research about this in education. So it doesn't matter. Uh, some pe sometimes people have a debate like maybe girls and women are naturally more caring than boys. Um, we could have that debate, but to me that's not very interesting. The point is that people have these expectations and people learn from them. So every day you learn how you should act in society. If you're having a bad day and you go to the mall and someone asks if they can help you and you just say, leave me alone, they become surprised and you learn from that, that your emotions aren't right. We're always learning about our emotions. So this also goes beyond the school, beyond the curriculum to something uh, much much deeper, I think, which people haven't been focusing on. It's certainly not the focus of a psychological intervention. So one of the reasons why I got fascinated with this topic is because of my experiences teaching. So I noticed when I started teaching here in Hong Kong, um, maybe you've seen these images before about, so, so there's a number of these images you can find online where they say in, uh, in Western culture, if someone looks sad, then they are sad. But in Eastern cultures, people might look happy, but they're actually not happy. Um, in Western culture, people are going to be very expressive and have a lot of ideas, though maybe their ideas aren't that good. Uh, this is my interpretation of these, these um, artistic works. In Eastern cultures, People will be more shy and humble, quiet and reserved about their idea, but it might be quite insightful. So one of the reasons I wrote this book is realizing how this works in a classroom setting, in a relational space. And, and so another interesting point here is that these things are very relational. So what I found um, when I first came here after uh, growing up in America is I would want my students to like feel good and be happy. And I'd say, you know, stand up, relax, you know, take a break, um, just tell me what you're thinking. I don't want to make this torture, I want to make this a positive experience because I believe that learning happens in a positive experience. And I noticed the more I would get excited about how the students, how I wanted the students to feel good, the more serious they would, they would look to me. And this is because we weren't really reading each other's signs. So they were trying to please me by being really serious and academic. But we were both just becoming more and more frustrated because we didn't notice these um, cross-cultural issues, or rather we noticed them, but they're so deeply ingrained inside of us to act a certain way. And within relationships, there can be a conflict here. So I started finding this incredibly fascinating. As I mentioned the issue with um, McDonald's service with a smile, I realized people having humongous smiles means different things in different cultures. And all of this really, confused me when it came to learning, intelligence, how to be an effective teacher. And I know this is something you've all been grappling with uh, as teachers here in Hong Kong as well. So there's cross-cultural differences when it comes to how emotions are conceptualized, how they are expressed. And so there's also a risk here when it comes to emotional education that it could be oppressive if you're saying to a student, you don't look like you have good well-being because you're not smiling. Uh, maybe in their culture, it's not normal to have a huge smile all the time. So this could also be very oppressive because maybe you feel the right feeling and your teacher's telling you you're not doing it right. This, this can be very confusing emotionally. Okay, so those are some sort of big picture ideas, but now I want to turn finally to uh, the implications for well-being and for resilience. 
So for well-being, uh, in the book I discuss happiness and well-being at length, and people have really different views about it and philosophy and psychology. Actually, a lot of debate here. And this is another thing I find really interesting when it comes to education for emotional well-being, is in reality, psychologists and philosophers are debating these issues very rigorously, the very key concepts and what they mean. When you look at the field, there's no universal views or common grounds. But then um, I think it's common in education, we make something a bit more simplified uh, to be more standardized and more common, but we lose something vital in that situation. So well-being has been connected to happiness, um, but not just to pleasure. So, so many people throughout history have thought about, um, you know, when you just feel good or you just eat a big meal or you get a massage, do you just feel pleasure? Is that happiness? Is that well-being? Most people will say, no, that's not really it because it involves something like this phrenesis, which I mentioned before, which is some kind of reflective evaluation, a feeling of satisfaction, fulfillment, and kind of a depth of feeling around that. But there have been different views about it. Um, there's different views among different Buddhists and Confucian scholars about how you fit into and accept the world around you from religious perspectives as well. There's a common emphasis on accepting reflectively the world around you to some degree. And there's always an open question here how much you should engage in that external world, whether you should just accept it or be a more active participant within it. So there's an assumption that, that well-being is good, of course, and happiness is good. Um, and Nell Noddings wrote in her book on happiness, happy people are rarely violent or intentionally cruel. And um, so this is debatable. So it depends on what you mean by happiness. I can think of people who look happy and are jerks. That's not hard for me to imagine at all, but she might be building it into her definition. She might be saying, my definition of happy includes that you're never violent or cruel, but does this reflect reality um, is another important question here. So learning well-being, um, so Ligman has said quite a bit about this here, who has been the most influential person in emotional intelligence. Um, so he has some suggestions. Pursue the pleasant emotions. As I mentioned, go for a run. Uh, Jubilee Center mentions uh, watching something funny or hanging out with your friends. Engage in gratifying experiences. Do good things, meaningful relationships, and dedicate oneself. And actually, if you read Seligman's books, he's actually changed his tune over time. He's realized he wrote one book, and he didn't really like the implications and the outcomes in it. So in the next book, he kind of changed his tune. Uh, but these, and, and again, these are debatable, but these are some common threads. So the challenges to reiterate in, in regards to the particular issue around well-being, um, again, it's culturally bounded, but treated as universal, treated as something inside one person when it's not necessarily. It can be socialized, again. Uh, it can be immoral or pathological, not necessarily well-being, because the definition of well-being demands that it's healthy. But if you're conflating it with happiness, it's not always a good thing, uh, contrary to Nell Nodding's. Intentions, uh, interventions are not very convincing, and there's important backwash effects here, which I think are important to consider when we're thinking about educating for well-being. So uh, firstly, it's culturally bounded. Um, so people who discuss happiness and well-being and satisfaction and fulfillment and these different concepts cross-culturally note that um, Western thinkers really tend to focus on it being a feeling inside a person about a person's life. So how do I feel about my life? But they say this really isn't the way it's thought about in, in Chinese cultures, that for Chinese philosophical schools, uh, they focus on and are directed towards fulfillment of others' well-being, and they regard the realization of human potential as the way to happiness. And for them, it's really directed towards other people's well-being. So there's no such thing as, do I feel good? Am I happy? Um, it depends on your relationships with other people here. 
There's a problem with this oversimplification, like I mentioned before with the example of Anne Frank. So uh, Peter Roberts has written a great book on happiness and despair in education, and he's argued that a pedagogical system that works against critical consciousness can allow social injustice to continue. Um, so he is focusing on this from an educational view, but this does match some psychological views about the risks of happiness. William James, a very famous um, historical psychologist, said, evil facts are as genuine a part of nature as good ones. So the presumption should be that they have some rational significance and that systematic healthy-mindedness fails as it does to accord to sorrow, pain, and death is incomplete. As mentioned here, feminist theory has been uh, very influential. Uh, there was first a book by Arlie Hochschild talking about, it's actually a really interesting book, talking about flight attendants and how um, whenever you see a flight attendant, they, they usually are, appear to be in a good mood and that's part of their job. But it's hard to be in a good mood all the time. And I think this is something we know intuitively as teachers, right? That we're supposed to be on all the time and sometimes day in and day out, working 40, 50, 60 hours a week, we're not always on. Sarah Ahmed um, extended upon this and expand this idea to talk about what she called the feminist killjoy. And the feminist killjoy is someone who points out, okay, I'm not being treated the same as other people, and there's something unfair. And, and they say, this person is the problem for killing the joy. So it's that person's problem for making the complaint. She's also discussed this in terms of um, race and ethnic dy dynamics with what she calls the melancholy migrants. So, the difficulties of multiculturalism are put on the ethnic minority who is blamed if people, even, it's like, even you don't want to talk about gender or, or ethnicity, right? It's like, you don't want to talk about it. It doesn't feel very good to talk about it. So it's, that person is blamed for the negative feeling because we don't consider society as a whole. Uh, some psychologists talk about pathological happiness. So pathological happiness is associated with being carefree, impulsive, and unpredictable. Uh, an association of happiness with obesity and indulgence in alcohol. So they say being too happy constitutes a risk to your well-being, to your life. Difficulty in facing mundane tasks and remembering negative memories. And difficulty acquiring a realistic understanding of the physical and social environment, because you're so caught up, you've had a big meal, you've had a lot of wine, and you're just feeling great, and you're not really thinking about um, the news that you were reading earlier in that morning. So when we think about here in Hong Kong, there's obviously a very serious problem with child well-being and youth well-being and teacher well-being. Obviously a really serious problem, uh, but it's interesting the way that the um, Education Bureau, and in particular the Committee on the Prevention of Student Suicides, has said this doesn't have anything to do with school. So it has, so it has to do with multiple factors, including mental illness, relationship and personal problem, family discord, academic concern, but they say no direct link between student, student suicide and education. And actually there was an article in SCMP from the student on that committee who said, I was at the committee and I said that I thought schools were part of the problem and they said this is not evidence-based. But somehow, all the things in that second bullet point, all the personal problem, family discord, academic concern, that doesn't have anything to do with schools, right? Young people spend time in schools and time doing homework at home. Schools have nothing to do with this. So I think we need to think critically about whether or not this is a useful way of thinking about things. What can we do here? Uh, so my argument's pretty simple, although I make the problem sound very complicated. Um, simply to recognize that there's a complex grammar about well-being. Consider when it may not be ideal. Sometimes it may not be ideal, and I'll elaborate this a bit more with resilience. And prepare for problem cases and be proactive. Like if, it's, if someone doesn't have good well-being or is unhappy, um, that's not some weird abnormality that can happen, um, and to be prepared for that and anticipate that, and maybe not have a solution right away to the problem. So resilience, so I mentioned with well-being and happiness, 
They're very highly contested terms in psychology and philosophy. No two philosophers or psychologists have the same definition. When it comes to resilience, there's not really all of that foundational work in any field. Um, the, the word resilience has meant so many different things. Often it's applied to systems, actually. And then when it comes to human resilience, it's thought of that the human is resilient and the human can be well um, if they're resilient. So it's connected to buoyancy, to staying uplifted no matter what, to staying focused, hardness, toughness, resistance, um, ironically, flexibility and elasticity. So, so people argue philosophically this is really not clear, it's really not coherent, it's all over the place. It just seems to be like anything that fixes the situation is resilience. And this is my concern, is that this word is just used, but we don't really know what it means. Um, but what it does is it says that I should have resilience, and I'm a problem if I don't have resilience. That's what the term does. It does this work, although it doesn't actually mean anything very useful. Um, so there's been a lot of critiques about the Penn Resiliency Program. Um, this is a resiliency framework for education. So much here, where do you begin? Uh, and this is a program that apparently young people can learn. Um, and I know you can't really see it very well here, but they have some terms like, take what you can get from relationships where there is hope, which sounds very sad. So it's sort of like anticipating you have all these terrible things in your life and just anticipate it and get over it and find some way to, to be buoyant in the situation. If you look at the research on resilience interventions, um, I personally don't find it very compelling. There may be some interventions that are useful, but what I found very easily was a lot of criticisms and critiques, and I noticed very quickly that there are a lot of limitations. So positive results can fade over time. Uh, it can be treated as a cure-all for, um, okay, the students are being naughty, they need resilience. I'm having a hard time managing my class today, they need resilience. Uh, I'm being a boring uh, speaker and everyone's falling asleep, they need resilience. So it seems to be just a solution for everything. There's no moral foundation to it. You can be a resilient criminal can be a happy criminal. You can be a criminal that has gratitude. You can be a terrible person with compassion. Actually, can, many cultures don't think of compassion as a wonderful thing. So again, there's the moral versus the functional here. Um, when they brought some of the programs into the United Kingdom, the teachers really didn't like them. They said, this is American stuff. This doesn't feel comfortable. We don't have these same kind of relationships. And I think it's worth asking here, should we all have those kinds of relationships? Should we feel comfortable talking about our feelings with people more than we do? Maybe we should, but I think that's a conversation we need to have rather than assume the American way is the best way, which tends to be an assumption here. So cross-cultural concerns and avoiding moral debates. So a few um, key references here. McGee and Stovall in an article in Educational Theory in 2015 they observed that resilience interventions resulted in so-called successfully resilient students feeling more stress hormones than other students, such that in the long run, those students could compromise their mental and physical well-being by being resilient. So a lot of these discourses are aimed towards urban youth in the Western world, uh, racial and ethnic minorities, poor black children, and they notice people look resilient but they actually feel worse, and they actually feel worse in the long run, and it's actually worse for their mental health in the long run. Relatedly, resilience education can lead to an enhanced sense of vulnerability among students who are identified as victims and deficient. So, um, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but if someone comes up to you and says, are you okay? You look sad, you look tired. This makes you, this actually kind of affects how you feel and it affects your relationship with them. And this is something that, of course, students feel this as well. So I'm, um, oh, one other thing here. So I mentioned we can use this word resilience, and it's doing some work for us. And I want to problematize the work that this concept is doing. In 2019, I was finishing, finishing up my book at the time, and I had to include this in my book. The Ontario education minister Defended, he said, we're going, she said, we're going to cut teachers and increase class sizes across secondary schools 
because the students need resilience. So what's going to help the students have resilience? I would think um, a loving home, good meals, quality relationships with their teachers. No, what, what they said is going to increase resilience is more challenges, because more challenges is going to make them more resilient. So in this instance, resilience discourse is used not only to justify. So we're not even saying here, you know, things aren't perfect, but it's OK. It'll toughen the kids up. We're not even saying that. We're saying, let's make things worse for kids to make them really tough. Like, we know the real world's just going to get worse and worse, so let's just toughen them up now. So this is actually used to make it more challenging. So here, resilience is promoted to provide worse education. A students need more resilience in order to cope with this bad education. So I find that very fascinating and very perverted, really, when it comes to caring for our students and their well-being. So I think I've gone just a bit over my time here, so I'll wrap up. Um, and if you come to my workshop, we can talk about what to do. I don't have any solution here, right? Um, I'm, I, like I said, I have a hard time getting grants for my research because I don't have solutions. I like to say the solutions don't work. Um, but here we can simply admit that this is complicated stuff. And we can admit it to ourselves, we can admit it to our students, and we can prepare them to think about these things a little bit more deeply than uh, some curriculum and some uh, self-help guides tell us to think about these things. Uh, so, should we be resilient? Maybe we should be resilient, but maybe not. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. is mentioned so much for how he's even-tempered, he's tolerant, he's not angry, although he was angry, he talked about anger, but he gets whitewashed in these curriculum guidelines. They say he's just this happy, lovey guy, everything was great to him. But in the 1960s, what we talk about as resilience today, they talked about as being adjusted. And so they asked him, what do you think about being adjusted? And he said that he was not really into being adjusted. He said, certainly we want to avoid the maladjusted life, but I don't want to become adjusted to discrimination. I don't want to become adjusted to bigotry. I don't want to be adjusted to economic conditions that take necessities for many to give luxuries to few. So uh, there's so much curriculum about Martin Luther King Jr. And we don't see these quotes mentioned as much as we see some other quotes mentioned by him. So questions um, that I don't have an answer to, but I'm a philosopher, so I hope that you know less than you less after this last hour than you knew before. That's just the way that I work. Uh, so the new questions I have for myself and for you. What does well-being and resilience look like? Does it always look a certain way? We're all cross-cultural educators. So how do we deal with this issue when we also are cultural beings ourselves? How can we know or judge when it's too much or not enough? Like, that student's not resilient enough. That student's too unhappy. How do we draw that line? And how can we care for our students and for ourselves, right? Because we're also people. Um, and Obviously, the answers to these questions depend on the situation. The situation today is a little bit more tough than it was for most of us uh, a few years ago. And lest you think that I want you to be like more amazing educators than you are, I always feel a little bit guilty after giving a talk to uh, fellow educators because uh, the point is that you're doing a lot, you're doing so much, I don't think you should hide that from your students. Um, I don't think you should make your life harder. Like, making your life harder doesn't make your students' life easier, right? So there's all these relational issues. We're people, too, in this situation. I don't think we can demand well-being or resilience of teachers or students in this situation. I don't think demanding it is helpful. I don't think it will enhance resilience or well-being to demand it or to suggest that there's one image of it. Um, I just found this image very, very simply. So um, I think we're all starting to accept that we have burnout here in Hong Kong. I haven't taken a holiday from work uh, in two years myself. I don't know about all of you. Um, dealing with burnout is a part of resilience and well-being too. So I think I've gone a little bit over my time, but if you want to talk more, I'm happy to talk during my workshop or in between the break or whatever if you have questions for me. Uh, so thank you so much for your time.
and I will uh, finish here. So have a bad day. <laughs>